Hello, everybody. I, I can't unfortunately say how nice it is to see you all, but I can see a few of you at the moment. It is very strange giving a talk by Zoom. I'm still getting used to it because every speaker knows that he or she gets a feel from how the audience are looking and behaving. Anyway, I thoroughly enjoyed Jim's talk last Saturday. And so I'm going to carry the story forward. Um, you see and know that my title is A Scottish Perspective on John Ruskin's Influence on the Arts and Crafts Movement. But I've decided that about the last third of my talk will be about the Guild of St George. Jim did mention it last week and I thought it gives me the opportunity to say a bit more. I'll say just a little bit more about the picture on the screen uh, because it shows the house in which my partner and I are living in Scotland in a beautiful village called Falkland about one hour's drive north of Edinburgh. It's a very typical early 17th century house with what we call Corby stepped gables or crow stepped gables at either end but it has a few feature which is quite unusual and that is and you just see its little pediment peeping out behind a tree it has a stair tower uh, we, we find it incredibly helpful for hanging pictures because there are always more pictures than walls in our house and the reason it's on the screen is that it's by a very very important arts and crafts architect called Robert Weir Schultz. I've come to admire him greatly and he was the favourite architect of the third Marquess of Butte and Lord Butte bought the Falkland estate where we live in 1887 and throughout the 1890s he was improving the interiors using Robert Weir Schultz as his designer and he was using as the designer of mural paintings and stained glass someone called Horatio Walter Lonsdale, a truly gifted man. And this painting is in fact by Lonsdale. We're all very intrigued to know why our house is represented in the painting, but it quite clearly is. And I think it may be because, and this is just my thought, uh, when people like architects or stained glass artists or mural painters came to do work on the big house, as we call it in Britain, uh, House of Falkland, they tended not to stay with um, the bigwigs, but to stay somewhere uh, very nice, but perhaps a little bit more modest and where they could be peaceful in the evenings and um, make their drawings and so forth. So it may be that our house was used as a kind of lodging house for the people who did the artistic work, but there's no proof of it. Anyway, it's a lovely house to live in uh, on four floors. Uh, unusual for a village house. I thought I should explain that the expression Scottish perspective is mine uh, rather than anybody else's but for some years I had been quite fascinated by the fact that so many of Ruskin's own perspectives were Scottish. This is not very widely recognized but it has been well put by his first biographer, William Gershon Collingwood, who was Ruskin's secretary, confidant and constant companion from 1881 until Ruskin's death in 1900. Um, the only portrait image of him I've been able to find easily, although I know there are others, uh, is on the left and it's a self-portrait showing himself as a, apparently a bluff sea captain. But I think you can see uh, that like Ruskin, he's somebody you feel you could trust, perhaps rather bluff and, and straight spoken, uh, attractive traits in themselves. And on the other side of the screen is a detail from Ruskin's uh, cross, memorial cross in the churchyard at Coniston where he lies buried. He was offered burial uh, in Westminster Abbey uh, uh, and he'd always said to his close relatives that he didn't want that, that he wanted to be always at Coniston. And uh, last September, we, a few of us gathered at the end of a weekend with the then master of the Guild of St George, Clive Wilmer, who's very well known to Jim, 
and a great friend of mine, and the director of Brantwood, Ruskin's home, um, from 1871 until 1900 on the shores of Lake Coniston. And the two of them read their favorite Ruskin passages. One of them was the last page of Praeterita, and it was so moving to stand by the graveside and hear those wonderful words. Anyway, this is my perspective on Ruskin and the arts and crafts movement, especially in Scotland. So, can we get rid of all that? Um, Collingwood's very opening words of the autobiography are, if origin, if early training and habits of life, and so forth, tastes, character and associations fix a man's nationality, then John Ruskin is, oh, something's gone wrong. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll start again. If origin, if early training and habits of life, if tastes and character and associations fix a man's nationality, then John Ruskin is a Scotsman. And you know, very few British people have that perception. He was born in London and he lived in London until uh, he bought Brantwood in 1871. Um, Anyway, um, he goes on, does Collingwood. The combination of shrewd common sense and romantic sentiment, the oscillation between levity and dignity, the restlessness, the fervor, the impetuosity, all these are characteristics of a Scotsman of parts and well-developed in John Ruskin. The English world owes much to Scotland in conduct of war and enterprise of commerce, but still more in literature. And above the rest, four names stand preeminent. Burns, that's Rabbi Burns, our national poet. Scott, that's Sir Walter Scott, the novelist. Thomas Carlyle, who was a great friend of Ruskin's and Ruskin himself. Ruskin's focus on art and architecture was vital for the next generation, for William Morris and those directly influenced by Ruskin and him, including and especially the artist Edward Byrne Jones and the architect Philip Webb, who is my particular favorite among that group. And the next two generations after them of architects and artists. But what I want to emphasize today is that they didn't just hear his artistic messages, they also heard his social message, his concern for the way in which the world had become, still worse, you could say, uh, by now, today, uh, and his passion to do something about it. As we, I'm sure, all know, for artists, architects and craftspeople of the arts and crafts movement, there were two books above all by Ruskin, which they simply had to read the Seven Lamps of Architecture of 1849 and the Stones of Venice of 1851 and three. And Morris and uh, Burne Jones read them together at Oxford as undergraduates. The chapter on the nature of Gothic in the Stones of Venice was especially influential and Jim mentioned that himself last week. But here is uh, one of the Queen's uh, paintings um, of, um, uh, of some, the square of St. Mark's, the Piazza di San Marco in Venice. Uh, and um, just to remind us of what this is all about, uh, towards the end of his life, William Morris described it as being one of the very few and inevitable writings of the century. To some of us, when we first read it, it seemed to point out a new road on which the world should travel. Probably following in Pugin's footsteps, and that's an important point to remember, I believe, uh, in many of the sentiments which Ruskin had, Pugin was in fact there uh, earlier than him, Ruskin argues that the social structure of the Middle Ages allowed the workman freedom of individual expression. It's quite a big claim that, and there are many threads 
which it would be interesting to follow through. Uh, quite a number of European cathedrals, Strasbourg, uh, for example, or Freiburg, or York, or Lincoln, or Wells in England, have teams of craftsmen that have existed, sometimes with short breaks, from the Middle Ages until the present day. Um, in England, we had something rather dreadful called the Commonwealth, um, uh, which covered the 18, 1650s. And during that time, the cathedral workshops were closed. And at the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, there had to be an enormous catch up uh, on all the repairs and maintenance that had not been done during that period. But most cathedrals in Britain and many cathedrals in other European countries do have permanent workforces. And when I was teaching at the University of York, which I was for 12 years, running something called the Centre for Conservation Studies, it was literally a five minute walk to the cathedral works yard. And on the left, you'll see an image of John David, who was the setter out of stone, um, of a stone to repair the great minster of York. And he's written a superb book, a handbook on how to do it. And all over the country, people come and seek his advice because he's such an expert on how to do it. And in the middle photograph, there is the quite young uh, Master Mason. And as I think you can tell from the picture, he's speaking quite passionately and with great uh, force and affection about his role uh, as a craftsman and about what a privilege he feels it to be working um, in the cathedral workforce, looking after the building day by day. Uh, and in the picture on the right, the man uh, on the left uh, with no jacket but a nice shirt, uh, he's Andrew Arrol, the cathedral architect. And in uh, Britain, every cathedral has to have an architect and a consultant archaeologist and a number of other people, which collectively we call the Fabric Advisory Committee. And I've been on Durham and Lincoln and St Paul's myself, and I was for 20 years the chair of the St Paul's Fabric Advisory Committee. And so I'm very aware that the way in which cathedrals are looked after today is a very collaborative affair. A great deal of money has to be raised. A great deal of skill exists. And I, I often wonder how aware Ruskin was of how it was in his day. Because, for instance, the lodges um, at um, Freiburg uh, and Strasbourg, which I briefly mentioned, they were certainly going full tilt uh, in the mid-19th century. And they still have some of their medieval drawings from which the original building work was done. Anyway, it's a great and interesting field. <clears throat> One of the most valuable teaching experiences of my life was being a member of the Wells Cathedral West Front Committee from the whole time of its existence from 1974 to 1986. And here I just want to recapitulate the quotation from Ruskin at the head of that page. We are always in these days endeavouring to separate the two. We want one man to be always thinking and another to be always working. And we call one a gentleman and the other an operative, whereas the workman ought often to be thinking and the thinker often to be working. And both should be gentlemen in the best sense. And I believe that at Wells, uh, I witnessed the very change that Ruskin was arguing for. Uh, at the beginning in 1974, and actually we were discussing setting up the committee to guide the restoration project for at least 18 months before that, it was all too obvious that the cathedral architect, a very distinguished man, rich in experience, was a gentleman and a thinker who seemed to treat the master mason and clerk of the works almost as a servant and addressed him by his surname, Wheeler, he would say. And I found this really offensive when I was up on the scaffolding with them both, that Alban, who called me Peter as an equal gent, uh, called 
the master mason we learn. However, as a committee, we met four or five times a year, and we always stayed over in the cathedral community for at least one night, working together during the day, uh, having supper together, and the service of Compline in the stillness of the cathedral at nine o'clock in the evening. And at the end of that 12 years, a time of great accomplishment in conserving the 400 sculptures on the West Front, Alban and Bert called one another Bert and Alban and had become firm friends. Each realized that he could not have achieved what he had achieved without the other. They had learned to appreciate and understand one another in the face of a daunting challenge to the integrity of the cathedral. And I was in Wells only eight days ago and very touched to see that the cathedral had put up to Bert uh, a memorial plaque, as you see. He died in 1990, alas. And it says, as you can see there, he devoted his life to the cathedral, first in the choir and then for many years in the mason's yard. A true craftsman. And a more wonderful thing could hardly be said about someone like that with all the skills that he undoubtedly had and so much wisdom too. I thought I might refer to what Ruskin calls three broad and simple rules uh, in this context. Never encourage the manufacture of any article not absolutely necessary, okay, in the production of which invention or design or inventiveness has no share. Fair enough. Never demand an exact finish for its own sake, but only for some practical or noble end. I suppose we could talk for quite a while about what Ruskin or, or we might mean by practical and noble is a very Ruskinian word, but you know, what does that mean exactly? And thirdly, never encourage imitation or copying of any kind, except for preserving record of great works. I think that final clause is very, very wise. And as many of us know, Ruskin was the great recorder, perhaps of all time, but certainly of the mid 19th century. Uh, on the scaffolding, he worked tirelessly to record the buildings of Venice, and he sent very talented people um, to record paintings, sculpture and buildings that he couldn't himself reach or hadn't got time or energy to do. However, nevertheless, I regard all such rules, even from Ruskin, with a certain degree of scepticism, because a right decision on such matters depends on so many factors. Uh, in the 1980s, I studied at the International Center for Conservation in Rome, and we used to save up for our philosophy teacher once a week, we had her give a lecture, uh, our trickiest questions. And when they had been posed, she nearly always said, beginning with the word in Italian, dipende, it depends. And often these decisions do depend on a great many complex factors. And so it was at Wells. What you're seeing now on the screen, I hope, is the very topmost part of the West Front and was the beginning of a great controversy about the restoration of the West Front, conservation perhaps I should rather say, uh, because the cathedral uh, was faced with a situation in which the um, figure of Christ was only a pair of knees and Henry Moore, the sculptor, and John Betjeman, the poet, wrote a letter to the Times saying how wonderful the superb trunkless pair of knees was. But the cathedral clergy said, it's giving the wrong message. It's giving a message of decay and destruction. Uh, the destruction took place either in the 16th century at the time of the Reformation or more likely in the mid 17th century Commonwealth that I've mentioned already, because it was possible to uh, get at that image with long poles from either side. Um, anyway, the Dean and Chapter said, um, we'll do what you all ask, 
we'll do it willingly, but at the end, we would like to have a figure of Christ in majesty by a good or, if possible, a great sculptor. But it is not to be a copy. So in that, that sense, um, we were obeying Ruskin's precept. It isn't a copy, it's a version, if you like, or something inspired by the context and by the need for a particular iconography. However, there is one sculpture, and it's on the left um, of the screen now, which was more or less a copy. Uh, a figure of a king which had fallen to the ground in the late 19th century and been patched up and it was vulnerable to falling again and there's a limit to the number of times you can do such a thing so we decided to commission a new one from the sculptor Simon Verity whom you also see on the screen but Simon spent a whole year working on the West Front so that every day during the week he was in close contact with these wonderful early 13th century figure sculptures of great dignity and beauty as you can see and in the end we felt he captured um, not the literal copy of the king which we didn't want but the feeling of that particular phase of medieval English art um, Ruskin, as we know, wrote and spoke passionately about the importance of seeing, seeing with care, seeing deeply, seeing with understanding. And in my opinion, that's exactly what Simon Verity did for us. Uh, and I, I consider it to be a great achievement. And I'm sure that very, very few people um, notice that it is a little bit different from the others. And of course, it isn't um, as eroded as that figure of the Queen is, for example, just to the right. And this reminded me, um, Simon was a friend, uh, and that the last time I saw him was in fact in New York, uh, when I made a special expedition to the Cathedral of St. John the Divine at the time when he was working on the Southwest Portal. And I'm, I guess many of you would have seen that portal and I hope um, been uh, touched by its beauty. It was a great project, perhaps one of the greatest sculpture projects um, of the late 20th century. During the arts and crafts movement, um, which I consider to be from its beginnings around about 1860 to 1930 or even later, the conventional practice as between architects and artist was generally against Ruskin's precepts. And William Collingwood's monument to Ruskin, of which you've seen a detail, is a case in point. He designed it uh, with a series of very beautiful drawings, but someone else made it. Uh, and in fact, he was in great demand in the 1920s uh, because people locally, local to Coniston and Brantford, realized that he had a really good feeling for uh, what a memorial cross should convey and so he designed quite a few in Cumbria and one or two elsewhere but there is Clive Wilmer the former a recent master of the Guild of St George on the occasion of which I spoke a little while ago it was just incredibly moving and I think you can see how very move it moved um, Clive himself was uh, at the end of it most arts and crafts architects specified minutely the nature of the construction and the nature of the ornament which they wanted. My ultimate hero after Ruskin himself is Philip Webb and it's always given me pleasure that they had such a warm and cordial relationship with one another. Uh, albeit Ruskin was born as we know in 1819 uh, and Webb in 1831, so younger generation. But on the left um, is the, uh, the stable at Four Gables, um, that's a misprint there, Four Gables at Brampton in Cumbria. And on the right is um, the chapel where we were married just last year, uh, designed by our local good arts and crafts architect, Reginald Fairley, 
1913, so quite late as you see. And in both cases, the architects drew out those walls in very great detail. And if you ponder them, you will see what a pleasing pattern the stone masonry makes, quite different in the two cases. I believe that Philip Webbs is probably strongly influenced by local vernacular buildings, which is what he always looked at uh, with Ruskin's seeing eye whenever he was asked to design a new building. It's just one of the subsidiary buildings of a very, very fine house called Four Gables. And the same with Reginald Fairley uh, on the right, uh, on our Falkland estate. Uh, the way in which the stones are placed, the way in which they are of different sizes and shapes has all been very carefully considered and not left to chance. Um, and it, it is one of the strange things about the arts and crafts movement in that following Ruskin, um, the architects uh, were all for giving the artist a free hand until it came to something they were designing themselves. But there were exceptions and also a development to, to do with the Art Workers Guild, which I will mention in a while. So what does the term arts and crafts apply to, uh, whether in Scotland or England uh, or anywhere else? I have a sort of working or evolving contention that it is meant to express the essential overall unity of creative activity in which the seeing eye of the artist and the skills of the craftsperson are melded together and neither is more important than the other. Because arts and crafts architects also consider themselves to be artists quite properly and sometimes they practiced as a craftsman as well, sometimes both. Uh, and presently I shall tell you of a specific example. Uh, in my pursuit of the Scottish arts and crafts movement, I have spent many happy hours in the uh, archive search room of Mount Stuart uh, on the Isle of Bute, the seat of the Marquis of Bute. And the large image on the left shows the room in which we work uh, when we're there I mean, as a visiting researcher. And I draw attention to the beautiful stained glass shields. And also I think you can just see what beautiful leading the windows have, which somehow uh, gives the room a great sense of scale uh, and interest. And at Mount Stuart, of course, the third Marquis is a very wealthy man and, and could afford more or less whatever he wanted to. But even the doorknobs in that house are something incredibly special and artistic indeed, but made by craftspeople by hand. And I show you a lovely example, the one on the, um, the, the door of that room. There are three libraries at Mount Stuart and this, the middle one, uh, was turned over to being the archives search room. And it's a real pleasure to work there, as I've said. In articulating Ruskin's line of thought and making it to some degree a reality, the way in which William Morris organized Morris and Company is significant and was also influential both on individuals or the numerous craft guilds which came into existence. Morris carried out a series of personal experiments in different crafts media, teaching himself to weave, for example, uh, from a 17th century French printed book and learning how to dye the cloths that were produced by the weaving. And also uh, he caused the Morrison Company to become really famous for its ability to design and produce stained glass and uh, Edward Byrne Jones and uh, Philip Webb and Ford Maddox Brown and sometimes others assisted in that design work and sometimes Morris himself would design a particular light or feature. Um, but on the right there you've got four symbols of the evangelists in exquisite little drawings by Philip Webb who did a good deal of design work for Morris and company, uh, not just as an architect, but as an artist designer. And on the left, we've got um, Edward Byrne Jones's tapestry 
of the Adoration of the Magi, of which there are a number of copies in existence. And this one is in the Norwich Castle Museum. One experience which Ruskin and Morris enthusiastically shared was reading the novels of Sir Walter Scott. Scott inspired in Morris his enthusiasm for medieval history and literature, which later emerged in his artworks. For instance, the painted decoration, furniture and stained glass for Red House. Now, if you were in front of me as an audience, I might feel moved at this moment to say, well, have you been to Red House? Have you seen it for yourselves? And I can be quite certain that a good number of you will have done that. Um, I, I was a trustee of it for a short while uh, before the National Trust decided to take, take it over. Uh, but they needed a large endowment and uh, we had to wait for a moment when they were able and prepared to find that money. But a number of wonderful pieces of furniture with painted decoration by the same people, um, Morris himself, his wife, Jane, Webb, um, Ford Maddox Brown, Edward Burne Jones, they all participated together over weekends in decorating the furniture and decorating the walls. And the ceiling of the staircase on the right was painted uh, by Webb uh, himself um, to a design which he had invented. I always think it looks very, very modern looking in a strange kind of way, though the staircase detail is very typical of him. The understanding of the importance of the crafts in daily life is happily still with us and is the most important legacy of the arts and crafts movement for us today. In my perception, I'd love to know what you all think, people are hungry for beauty and dignity in their lives, sometimes perhaps not consciously realising it, but often very responsive to it. And it is remarkable how in Britain um, we have such enormous numbers of visitors to our ancient cathedrals, for example, and also to our ancient parish churches. So I thought I'd show you a particular example which is rooted uh, not only in the Scottish landscape and cultural context, but in fact in our very village of Falkland. So, um, on the left, you have an image of one of our very good local furniture makers, James McKean. And with him is the director of our charitable trust, the Falkland Stewardship Trust. And we're sitting at my work table and we've been discussing the design for two clusters of rather throne-like chairs um, to be placed outside our stable block, which is where we have um, all the facilities for the activities that we do. And on the right, you can see how people love those chairs, or people of all shapes and sizes. And we now have a cafe, which we did, oh yes, we did. I can see a tray with uh, a teapot on it. But um, on a nice day, you'll find these seats, uh, perhaps not at the moment when we're all distancing from one another, but normally they're a buzz with activity, with um, grown-ups and elderly people and children and dogs and so forth. And in the background you can just see uh, a typical 19th century park railing and beyond it that contoured surface which betrays um, a design landscape, probably of the 18th century, modified in the 19th century. And going back to James McKean, as I've mentioned there, he trained with Tim Stead the most famous uh, furniture maker of Scotland um, of the late uh, 20th, very early 21st century. But sadly, uh, he died of cancer um, a, a, in his late 40s. And Jim James McKean took over um, his workshop as foreman for a while, but had been trained by him. But we're lucky enough that he has his workshop um, in our parish uh, and lives uh, about 15 minutes drive away and so all the work that we've had done to our house and the last five years has been done by him. And in fact I realised that um, from my very front door I can think of two excellent furniture makers, a potter, a stained glass artist, a saddler 
and quite a number of people who are working creatively with textiles. You might think that a saddler is unusual, and perhaps it is, uh, but we're very lucky to have in Jennifer Roy, in one of our nearby villages, uh, working. Um, I've got two belts, one brown and one black, that she very kindly made for me. But you can see the quality of her work in that big photograph. Uh, and in this photograph, she is taking part in our annual craft symposium. Uh, I've now organized five uh, in order to encourage local craft activity and also to inform people that it exists. People don't always know how to find people who can do particular things. But she gave a most wonderful talk um, at one of our craft symposia, and I learned from her that to become a master saddler, which she is, takes 10 years. One of Ruskin's most insightful quotes, I believe, about craftsmanship occurs in the Eagle's Nest, where he says, cherish above all things, above all things, local associations and hereditary skill. And I think he's absolutely right. It's such a wonderful expression of, in a way, the obvious. But I live in a country where the government commissioned, um, in the, um, what's the right word? Uh, personal protection equipment um, for um, our health service, not from our own small firms who could do it, and there are hundreds of, of firms who could do it, but from China and Turkey, which seems really weird, the complete opposite of Ruskin's advice, local associations and hereditary skill. We've got really talented men and women who can do great things, as I know that you have in the USA and in Canada as well, but we have to give them opportunities. I skipped over this image of the stables. When I became a trustee, which is nearly 20 years ago, the stables were not derelict, but very badly neglected from the post-war period. And also they had very few uses, although uh, the whole of one side was cottages. Uh, you can see from above now those wonderful throne-like seats at the front of the stables. Uh, we still have two people, uh, two families, two households living in the stables, which is good for security. We have a holiday cottage. We have a gallery for art and we have a cafe and it's absolutely humming. It's a very good reuse of beautiful early 19th century stables, courtyard stables. So um, anyway, that's where many of our activities happen. And we regard ourselves as managing the estate in the spirit of Ruskin and not only in the spirit of Ruskin, but also of his Scottish disciple, Patrick Geddes, who was a really important figure. Um, uh, he wrote uh, a book, a, a, a long article, which was published as a small book on Ruskin's economics. They corresponded together. Uh, they, I think they appreciated each other, but many Ruskinian messages have come down to us in Scotland um, directly from Patrick Geddes. So now I tie together both um, Ruskinian thoughts and the work of Philip Webb, because we are privileged in Scotland to have the first country house uh, that Philip Webb designed at Arisaig, uh, which is on the west coast of Scotland. And meanwhile, as I have put at the top of that page, um, uh, Letherby quotes a letter from John Ruskin to the civil servant and well-known 19th century author, William Hale White, who wrote as Mark Rutherford, I am happy to recommend to you a young architect who gives good work for a fair price. His name is Mr. Philip Webb. What a thought, isn't it, that Ruskin felt he could write so warmly. Uh, apparently he and Webb had been discussing philanthropic housing, which we know consistently to have been one of Ruskin's great concerns uh, how dreadful it was that um, the poor were living in such insanitary and terrible conditions in London and all the growing, rapidly growing cities um, of the north of England. And that led to collaboration 
with Webb, who built a very fine group of um, houses on the edge of the city of London, and of course, famously with Octavia Hill, to whom uh, Ruskin uh, gave uh, suitable buildings for um, housing the poor in a, a decent, respectable and good manner. So Webb and Hale White became firm friends. Hale White took Ruskin's advice and Webb designed a house for him at Carl Shorten, which is on the southern side, the Surrey side of London. Uh, there are extensive outbuildings by Webb um, at Arisaig, including, uh, this is my favourite, Borrowdale Farm. It's actually an 18th century laird's house, what in England we would call a small manor house, because uh, in Scotland we still very much use the concept and word laird, meaning the principal citizen, man or woman, of a place. Uh, and it had become a, a farmhouse. And um, the um, dormer windows, beautifully detailed, are very, very characteristic of Webb. And so is the loggia. Quite a number of his houses have loggias. And he made it into two apartments, one for the buckler of the big house and the other for the factor. And factor is a word we use in Scotland to describe the person who manages an estate on behalf of the owner or the owning family. Of importance, again, is the use of local materials and the roof materials are local West Scotland slates of great beauty of colour and texture. The young man who commissioned Arisaig House, Francis Astley, died quite young and Webb designed a magnificent memorial to him, which you see on the left, and he designed other family memorials as well. Uh, but I found in the Victorian Albert Museum archive a drawing showing the typical way of arts and crafts working with every detail carefully drawn out by Webb, uh, the architect. And there it is, damaged but very eloquent, uh, and with handwritten instructions in Philip Webb's characteristic handwriting. But in spite of designing everything for them, warm uh, relationships always seem to exist between Webb and his craftspeople. I suppose he was able with his great knowledge to show them that he understood what they were doing and to encourage them uh, and guide them rather than boss them about as sometimes or perhaps rather often happened in those contexts. Webb cared passionately, of course, about craftsmanship and uh, a wonderful letter uh, also quoted by Letherby is one to a young, a young man who said he'd like to become an architect. What should he do? Where should he go? And Webb wrote back to him a very, very good letter saying, well, what you should do is to become a carpenter for at least a year. And if you learn one building trade really well, you'll be surprised to find that you understand all the others quite a lot better than you would have done if you'd just become an architect. And again, the advice was taken. So I must mention now an architect not well known outside Scotland, um, Robert Rowand Anderson just three years younger than Philip Webb and based in Edinburgh, who is or may not be considered to be an arts and crafts architect. I consider him to be an arts and crafts architect of the earlier phase. Uh, as many young architects from Scotland did, he went up to London for a period of apprenticeship with the great Sir George Gilbert Scott in London. And George Gilbert Scott was regarded as an arch restorer. And so Ruskin and the SBAB regarded him with a certain amount of suspicion. And Ruskin, understandably, because he um, looked with passion at landscape, and as we all know, uh, greatly uh, valued the work of Turner, he saw one of our great Scottish cathedrals, Dunblane, through the eyes of Turner, and he was strongly opposed to the re-roofing of the nave 
and the restoration of the eastern parts of the building. But I believe there are many reasons why Ruskin's cry of leave it alone was not appropriate in this case. Look at the photograph on the right. Um, the restoration was carried out between uh, 1888 and 1893. And so probably the photograph, which is one of the series that I have on file, was taken as part of the investigation into whether it was technically, um, financially and in other ways possible to uh, put a roof back on. And as you see, considering it had been open to the skies for at least 200 years, it is astonishingly complete and astonishingly beautiful. More beautiful, I think, than it appears um, in Turner's rather generalized image, which you see on the left. Anyway, I am myself a vice president of the Leave It Alone Society. But in spite of that, I don't think that it's always the right thing to do. Um, in that time, they didn't have the tradition which has been evolved since then of looking after ruins as though they were precious works of art, which indeed they can be, but with a proper regime of maintenance. And so many of our great castles and ruined abbeys, ruined castles and ruined abbeys in Britain are beautifully preserved in that way. But at that time, there was no tradition of doing that. The congregation of the cathedral was growing and they needed the accommodation. So what happened? On the left is Robert Rowand Anderson's invention, which of course Ruskin praised, uh, there was nothing to copy, invented a form of ceiling and a roof structure which would fit the bill. And I'm always thrilled when I go there. I really find it really, really beautiful. And because I think what Ruskin didn't necessarily take into account was that there were good craftsmen then, just as there are now, in spite of everything, and just as there were also in the Middle Ages, and that if they and other people, other skills, like the architect skills, work collabor collaboratively together, then great work can be done. So the second image shows the door hinges on one of the three pairs of doors designed by Anderson, and they are beautiful and I'm undoubtedly made by a good local blacksmith. There is no other way, certainly at that time. And on the right is the organ case uh, with its intricate carving uh, by the Clough brothers who worked a good deal for Robert Lorimer, uh, the greatest, considered to be the greatest of Scottish arts and crafts architects. I give his dates there, 1864 to 1929. He succeeded Robert Rowand Anderson as the cathedral architect, and he employed the Clough brothers a good deal, not only on the organ case, but also on the choir stalls and other woodwork. So much so that many people consider Dunblane Cathedral to be the cathedral of the arts and crafts movement in Scotland. I haven't said anything about the stained glass, but again, it has superb late 19th, early 20th century arts and crafts stained glass. So I should say a little I feel about the SPAB, the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings, founded in 1877 by Maurice and Webb with Ruskin's specific backing. It's the second of the three organizations which still flourish today, founded on the inspiration which their founders had found through reading and careful pondering of Ruskin's writings. So the third is the Art Workers Guild, 1884, which promoted the unity of all the arts, denying that there was a distinction or should be a distinction between fine and applied art. And as someone who's looked into the archives of these bodies, I'm very aware that many of the same people belong both to the SPAB um, and to the Art Workers Guild. The uh, Guild of St George had, until relatively recently, always a rather small membership. Uh, and now we're, we, we've grown in a rather remarkable way. Um, thanks very much to the policies pursued by our recently retired master, Clive Wilmer, uh, with his wonderful gift of communication uh, and warmth of personality. Of course, in 1877, 
there was a passionate need to have a body like the SPAB. Ruskin had planned it for a long time. And as I'm sure you know, it was called in the early days very often anti-scrape. And my left hand image is of a 14th century wall painting in a church in Yorkshire called Easby. And so often before the SBAB and the awareness of Ruskin and Morris um, and Webb and their colleagues, uh, people scraped off medieval plaster and the various paint layers, either ignorant of or not caring about the beautiful medieval art which lay beneath. So of course there was a necessity for a strong campaign and for the whole anti-scrape philosophy. Uh, and one of the great things the SPAB does these days is to be the major educational and training uh, organisation for conservation of historic buildings in Britain. At our craft symposia uh, in the Falkland stables, and you can see that their table is in fact placed in one of the horse divisions um, with the feeding unit uh, beyond, we always have the six, I only caught three of them, uh, the six William Morris craft fellows and scholars, three of each, sometimes four of each. And it's always a joy to have these young people with us, totally committed to working in the spirit of Morris and therefore of Ruskin and learning a great deal from um, the year in which they had that privilege of uh, rather like medieval craftspeople did wandering around Britain. Uh, though this, nowadays with appointments made and no doubt much exchange of emails and so forth. Anyway, we have a document called the SPAB approach, which you can easily find on our um, website, um, which sets out what we now believe we, we stand for in terms of philosophy and conservation ethics. Uh, we have a very, very wonderful staff team, uh, very committed guardians. I'm having a year off at the moment and specialist committees, including a Scotland committee. Now I come to, um, in a way, my big story about Scotland and the arts and crafts movement. Um, I could have spoken to you at much greater length about Mount Stewart uh, on the Isle of Bute, but I explained that not everyone considers Robert Rowan Anderson to be a very developed arts and crafts architect. I could have spoken to you about the house uh, of our estate, the House of Falkland, which I love very much uh, and know a good deal about, but there is one other house which is peerless in terms of the context of the arts and crafts movement in Scotland. Um, it's called Melsetter. It's on the island of Hoy, which is the second largest island of the Orkney archipelago. And there on the left is an image of it. It rises very steeply up from the sea. The foreground is what they call mainland Orkney, which is the largest of the Orcadian Islands. And it's, it's a rather perilous seeming journey from one to the other. Also, of course, great fun when the weather is um, uh, pleasant. And Millsetter House, you have a first glimpse of it on the right. Um, in the beginning was a house of um, 1738, the left-hand part of what you see, uh, a typical Georgian Laird's house of no particular strong character. Uh, and what Letherby did was to add on to it to make quite a large country house, 11 bedrooms, I think there were, three bathrooms, uh, fine drawing room, fine dining room, um, all the usual domestic offices and so on. And a very particular interest uh, is that triple gable, uh, which has three initials, um, T for Thomas, M in the middle for Middlemore, and T for Theodosia, Thomas Middlemore's wife. He was a Birmingham businessman. She came from a Highland family um, in Sutherland. But Letherby, he is really one of the most important figures in the arts and crafts movement in Britain. Uh, and again, we're lucky to have his master work in terms of housing in Scotland. He was um, 
perhaps he became anyway more of a teacher than an architect so there are only six really major projects of his but they were important like this one he was principal of the central school of arts and crafts he had a star studied a star studied team of 11 teachers there a brilliant writer one very important book of his is architecture mysticism and myth but there are about a dozen others and i've been collecting them in first editions over the years and he was surveyor to the fabric of westminster abbey um, the most important building arguably in britain so uh, in addition to part of the old laird's house some cottages and farm buildings were retained so when you arrive as in the image on the left you feel as though you're arriving not at a big country house uh, but in a community somehow uh, and in Scotland it's not uncommon for new work to incorporate old it suggests an element of respect for the work of the past an unwillingness to discard the labour of forebears perhaps in recognition of the difficulty of working stone some stones in particular ours is a very stony country rich in geology which as we know was ruskin's great passion and good building stones abound but also i'm wondering whether lethaby may not have been influenced in retaining old material that passage in the seven lamps where ruskin says that there is a sanctity in a good man's house which cannot be renewed in every tenement that rises on its ruins so on the right uh, we have the uh, i think it's the factor's house but it, it may have been a farm manager's house but Lethaby has added to it a very endearing porch which suggests the shape of an upturned boat and there is a good deal of imagery in and around um, the house and its outbuildings which suggests the influence of the surrounding sea or the boats which are necessary for the surrounding sea so the next thing you come to in that little lane is the spinning cottage where may morris no less and theodosia middlemore used to sit and spin the sheep's wool from hoy for it to be woven into cloth and there again i'm inclined to quote that wonderful teaching of ruskin's mentioned earlier cherish above all things local associations and hereditary skill now, in the time of the late owner this was a holiday cottage and i always meant to take it but somehow never got round to it i have been to this house five times in my life and i hope there will still be other opportunities but alas elsie Sita, laird of hoy whom you see here died a couple of years ago she was a most lovely person i felt that she almost radiated an arts and crafts character in herself every summer she made the spab scholars and fellows very welcome and they helped uh, her maintain and look after the house uh, and the, the furniture in the kitchen of unpainted pine of course is inspired by the sort of thing you might find in farmhouses but designed by Lethaby with conscious simplicity um, one of the five occasions i went there i went with a friend and on the ferry on the way over i noticed that it was a day when she would not be open to the public usually i had arranged it in advance um, but i thought well i'll go there anyway and see what happens so we drew up outside the kitchen door which you can just see uh, on the right hand photograph at the right and the door immediately opened and she came rushing down and said i'm not open today and i said i know i'm terribly sorry um, and then i started to remind her of previous visit she, she, she said oh never mind all that come and have a coffee and we'll talk about it uh, she was making jam which was interesting in itself or maybe it was marmalade and we had some coffee and a lovely chat and then she twinkled and said i know what you two want to do you just go off and show yourselves round and so of course 
we had a wonderful visit. And she also is the last person, I'm sure, to describe me as young man, because uh, three years ago when I was there, um, I had booked with her on the telephone, uh, and I thought I would be with the friend who was with me, the only people there, and a small group of other people that had a similar idea. So there were about perhaps eight or 10 of us. And she made a little speech of welcome, and she said, I'm afraid that none of you is allowed to take photographs, except for this young man here pointing at me. And I'm sure I shall never be described as this young man again, but I'm not going to tell you how old I am. So here is the hall with a fireplace of great individuality, very strong design, somewhat like Philip Webb's fireplaces were wont to be, and a table designed by Letherby himself, uh, ravishingly beautiful. And on the right, you see a detail of the plaster work, um, which was ordered by Letherby from his very, very great friend, Ernest Jimson. And Ernest Jimson uh, had a, a workshop with different trades based in the village of Sapperton near Sirencester in the Cotswolds. And apparently um, the sections were sent up to Hoy in packing cases and assembled there, perhaps by the estate building team. The island of Hoy was purchased as a somewhat run-down estate, and the Middlemoors lavished money and attention on it and gave support, employment and encouragement to the members of the small island community, which had been languishing uh, before they came um, in the 1880s, 1890s, I mean. So here is the fireplace in the drawing room, again with that rather clever wavy design uh, by using the marble in a particular way and the cheeks of the fireplace in every room including the bedrooms are lined with exquisite uh, 17th century dutch tiles or just possibly copies of them but they look uh, original don't they uh, and these were very often supplied by morris and company and much in the house was supplied by the Morris Company. Uh, other things were, uh, as I've shown, specially designed by Letherby uh, and made by furniture makers contracted by him. Um, and the Middlemores also went to the exhibitions of the Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society from 1888 onwards. Here is the dining room with yet more beautiful plasterwork both on the beams and in the frieze from Jimson's Cotswold workshops. Jimson died far too young and there was a memorial volume to him subscribed to by his friends and there is an absolutely brilliant essay in it by Letherby and in it he wrote here meaning at the SBAB Jimson's love for old buildings deepened into a passionate reverence. And from this very regard, he came early to see that ancient architecture was an essence and reality, not a style, which might be resumed in another kind of society by a different people. And to conclude what Bethany said about Jimson, which says, I believe so much about the SBAB and about the arts and crafts movement, it is a curious fact that this society, engaged in an intense study of antiquity, became a school of rational builders and modern building. Here Jimson for years was in close contact with Philip Webb, Morris's friend from the Oxford days, and for the early years of the SPAB's existence, the architectural member of Morris and Co, a stern thinker and a most able constructor. I love that phrase about Webb, don't you? A stern thinker and most able constructor. And both those things were very true. So anyway, um, at Hoy, uh, at Millsetter, there is also a lovely walled garden. I imagine the 18th century wall garden uh, modified. And into one of its walls is a really beautiful chapel. I don't know if you can see it 
at such a scale, but the bell coat at the left hand end is topped with a roof, which again is in the shape of a boat, uh, a lovely little symbol of the location of the house and its chapel. And on the right, there is um, Elsie again in the middle of a small group of us. Um, the chapel has a roof of unreinforced concrete, an extraordinary idea. But one of the wonderful things I believe about the arts and crafts movement is that in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a perfection of traditional methods of craftsmanship and handling of materials, but there were also new materials becoming available. And there was a great um, desire to experiment and see what would work. And a year or two later, Letherby designed and uh, had built a church called Brockhampton by Ross. Ross is in Herefordshire. Uh, I used to go there once a year thinking it kept me sane in my busy life. And it too has a vault of unreinforced concrete like the one here, but outside it is thatched, a remarkable combination. So still inside the chapel on the left is the font uh, designed by Letherby, and it is known who carved it, but I'm afraid I can't find my note saying who it was. Um, the middle image is of the stained glass window behind the altar, which was designed by Fort Maddox Brown for Morrison Company. And on the right, the single light window is of St. Margaret of Scotland, and there's another one of St. Colm, and they are both by Christopher Wall, who was one of the 11 tutors uh, working for, uh, working to and for um, Letherby at the Central School of Arts and Crafts. And he was a stained glass artist, so he designed, and maker, recognized as a leader in the arts and crafts movement. And he wrote a wonderful book, which I have, published in 1905, called Stained Glass Work, a textbook for students and workers in glass. Great emphasis there on work and workers. I have great friends in Munich who own a firm, third generation, which makes beautiful stained glass and beautiful mosaic work. And in Germany and some other European countries, the tradition is that a painter, often a very distinguished painter, will design a stained glass window for um, a church or a cathedral, and then firms uh, like the friend belonging to my friends, Peter and Elgin van Traeg, uh, they do the specialist making up. So the two things, designing and making, are separate. But our British tradition is that the maker and the artist are generally the same person or the same team. So I felt I should end by saying something about the Guild of St George. After all, it's the reason why I'm speaking to you, because uh, I am responsible for international relationships to the rest of the board, uh, a great privilege. And through it, I've developed a very, very happy uh, relationship uh, with the great initiative being taken uh, in North America by Jim and others uh, to establish a Ruskin Society of North America, a wonderful initiative with which we hope always to be in the strongest of partnerships. So it was founded in 1871, as, as has been mentioned before, but mentioned by Alan in his introduction. And there came a moment when Ruskin wrote about the cultural and economic poverty of British society. For my own part, I will put up with this state of things passively, not an hour longer. His personal motto was today, spelt or written like that, not to put off doing things until tomorrow, as we all tend to do. What are we as the Guild doing today that I can communicate to you today, now? So first of all, we declare an overall commitment to Ruskinian principles, especially social ones, 
and to an extent to Ruskin's economic and architectural principles. To an extent, I, again, this is something we could discuss at great length, but there are ways in which the world has moved on in terms of architecture and of our understanding of economics. But nevertheless, uh, Ruskin has a great deal to teach us about both. Secondly, we are a charitable foundation, an educational charity in United Kingdom law, and we create all kinds of forums for discussion of Ruskinian ideas and practices, and we arrange them in all kinds of places. I've been to two or three of the Art Workers Guild uh, headquarters in London, and I've been to others in Oxford and in Sheffield and Lancaster and elsewhere. Our charitable tripartite commitment is to art, craft, and the rural environment. What a wonderful trio that they are. And I am currently leading the subgroup of the board devoted to craftspeople and craftsmanship, which I also feel is a great privilege for me because I have been so passionately interested in craft craft people and craftsmanship all my grown up life, or perhaps before, because I grew up on a family farm in Warwickshire near Stratford. And my father and his foreman had an outbuilding which they called the tool shed. And in it were rows and rows of the most beautifully uh, kept tools, which they used to repair our buildings and our machinery. They did it themselves because they had such skills. And I was very fascinated by what they did, and especially what they did to keep our farm buildings, which were beautiful, uh, in good repair. So then we have the Ruskin collection, which was given by Ruskin to the Guild of St George. So we are the faithful, I hope faithful, trustees of it. And it consists of literally thousands of works of art, artefacts, illustrated books and minerals. And we are in a partnership with Museums Sheffield. We have quite a number of important partnerships and that is one of the most important, but they are also very important with the University of Lancaster's um, Ruskin Centre and with Brantwood, Ruskin's house uh, in the Lake District. So last year, as part of our celebrations of Ruskin's 200th birthday, we collaborated on an exhibition at Two Temple Place in London, uh, quite near the temple as its name suggests, uh, creating a stunning exhibition, John Ruskin and the Art of Seeing. Now I'm not very good with numbers, but I think something like 46,000 people visited it, the best attendance that gallery has ever had. They only have one exhibition a year and they have to be very special. Uh, on the left, you see an image of the staircase um, of the um, building, uh, which was, um, I won't go into its history, but it is a very fascinating one. And the building is by John Loughborough Pearson, a great Victorian architect. And then there are two images which show photographs of the first Ruskin Museum in Sheffield in what was no doubt then a hamlet called Walkley, uh, which I shall show a little bit more of uh, in a moment. Anyway, it was a great exhibition. Uh, of course, we had the opening, but I went there on four other occasions uh, and bowled over by the beauty of Ruskin's own work. There was also an exhibition in the Doge's Palace in Venice, which we made a special expedition to Venice to see. Uh, Ruskin's own work as an artist is, as you will all know, exquisite. So then we have Ruskin land. We have a chunk of the Forest of Wire in Worcestershire near a beautiful small historic town called Bewdley. And the motto of that place is something that Ruskin urged us, that we should find some part of English land which could be run, managed, in such a way that it would be beautiful, peaceful, fruitful, sharing everything there with schools, universities, students and local people, sharing skills, 
teaching and training. And we have that wonderful new building, which you see in the right hand photograph uh, as part of that uh, provision. And on the left is John Isles, uh, a fellow board member of the Guild of St George, a really delightful man. He and his wife, Linda, have transformed the Guild's presence at Ruskin and, and they have achieved so much, not only by their knowledge and intuition, but also by their warmth and kindness and their welcome to everyone who goes there. It's really thrilling. And if you haven't been there, do put it on your list. But that's true of all the things and all the places I'm telling you of. In January, we had a weekend of discussing our Guild strategy. Uh, and it was, I think it was the first meeting of the board we had since our new master, Rachel Dickinson, uh, presided over us. And what a happy time we all had together. She had, of course, been a director before and is a very senior academic. Uh, but here we are planting trees uh, and we looked with admiration at the traditional rural skills. Hedge laying is a great craft, uh, not often practiced these days, but how beautiful it is and how preferable it is to barbed wire fences, which I particularly dislike. And um, a friend of mine in our village is having a real campaign about the fact that hedgerows, when they're ripped out, don't provide any shelter for the animals, the, the sheep and the cattle, uh, goats or whatever there are um, in the winter, and she's quite right. And then working with students from the University of Sheffield, a number of artworks have been created and other board members are gathered. Uh, it was January, so it was pretty cold and so we, were, we were glad to have a little bit of shelter. But working with wood and um, working with the skills of forestry, uh, the wise management of land is what we're trying to fulfill there. And on the 5th of November, we shall publish a handbook based on our five years of promoting uh, an initiative called Ruskin in Sheffield, a cultural programme of events and activities inspired by Ruskin's ideas on making lives better. I think if you don't remember anything at all about this talk, I'd like you to remember that Ruskin is all about making lives better. And perhaps you might also clutch to your heart as I have done, cherish above all things, local associations and hereditary, hereditary skill. Anyway, the author of this book uh, has been our, our manager, uh, our, our muse, our everything, our enabler uh, of the project, Ruth Nutter, who is a very dynamic and inspirational person. Ah yes, we called her the Guild's producer. Uh, I, I'm forgetting the title, but there was no aspect of that program that she did not design and carry out, though attracting countless collaborators and supporters. So everything she speaks of in this book, uh, I have a copy of it uh, near to hand at the moment, and I've been reading it carefully and thinking hard about it. Uh, everything she writes about, she really understands and powerfully knows. The book has been endorsed by a fellow guildsman or companion, as we say, Dame Fiona Reynolds, former Director General of the National Trust, in the following resounding words. This book is nothing short of inspirational. John Ruskin wanted to do something remarkable for Sheffield, and the work described here is remarkable too, and steeped in his values. The wonderfully engaging range of activities energized curiosity, life and joy among communities across Sheffield and provides a model to coin the most common response from participants. This is just lovely. And I thought this was a good moment to remind ourselves that John Ruskins was one of the principal voices of inspiration for the founding of the National Trust 
1895, out of which evolved the separate but related National Trust for Scotland, 1931, of which I was once Director of Conservation. The three personalities known as the founders were Octavia Hill, Sir Robert Hunter, and Canon Hardwick Rawnsley. They were all friends and disciples of his and felt his powerful influence and support. Well, I thought to illustrate the idea of um, the properties of National Trust, I would show you two National Trusts for Scotland uh, sets of images. Here is the Hill House by Charles Rennie Mackintosh, one of the great architects of all time. And I think one could say a late arts and crafts architect in many respects. But because he had rather touching faith in modern materials, the whole building needs drying out. And so with tremendous boldness, and I'm sure immense expense, the National Trust for Scotland has given it a shelter or carapace brilliantly designed. And it is really fascinating to walk around at the higher levels and look down on the house below and see those parts which normally one can't see or reach. And then all those people I've just mentioned, including Ruskin himself, were all passionate about how all citizens should have access to fresh air, not just the rich, not just those shooting and so forth, uh, for our health, for exercise and general well-being. And it's not always realised that the trusts, National Trust and National Trust of Scotland, are not only about country houses, which came much later, but own and manage literally tens of thousands of acres of coastline and hill and mountain country. And their example has been followed worldwide. I believe there are about 60 national trusts in the world. So here on the left is one of my favorite NTS properties, Ben Laws, a mountain rich in flora and fauna. And on the right, something completely different, a landscape park. Um, belonging to the trust, which is managed in collaboration with the city of Glasgow, where people can um, exercise uh, and, as you see, um, do particular rituals. Dame Fiona is currently the master of Emmanuel College, Cambridge, and the author of a superb book, totally imbued with the spirit of John Ruskin, called The Fight for Beauty. The fight for beauty expressed through buildings, landscapes, and the objects or artifacts through which we live the daily intimacies of our lives is one in which we all, like Ruskin was, need to be engaged. We have plenty of enemies, as Professor Spates's images of commercial architecture showed us last week. So I thought to myself, what can I show that I feel is beautiful, that I associate with the daily intimacies of our own lives. One is a teapot made for us in silver by Rod Kelly. And it's not just the teapot that I admire, but the extraordinary skills that he has and his ability to teach them. And on the right, a sculptor friend made for us as a wedding present with his unique and special own invented lettering and nameplate for our house which was built incidentally to be the home of the hereditary falconer to the Scottish Kings. The whole point of Ruskin and Sheffield was to make a difference to the local communities of Sheffield according to four of Ruskin's principal ideas. No wealth but life, the rural economy, not for present use alone, and that we should go to nature as a primary source of beauty, inspiration, education, and artistic practice. So one of Sheffield's urban villages is especially connected with the Guild because it was at Walksley, as I mentioned earlier, that he established the first Ruskin Museum with the beginnings of the collection with which he gradually endowed the Guild. And one of, our, one of Ruth's wonderful initiatives was based on the Carnegie Library in Walkley. And here is a quote. 
We originally flinched at the idea of spray paints in the library and hanging paintings and sculptures in and on a listed building. What you in the USA call a landmark, for us is the rather unimaginative listed building. But people learn to be creative from each other, my italics, when facing difficult tasks. And it was a joy on the day of opening the exhibition for us to perambulate as a group of directors and our partners, our friends, and see the art all by teenagers, which had been called into existence by this particular project. Another very successful project was a pop-up Ruskin Museum in the very place where he had had, not the actual site, but in the same parish as it were. And the local paper, the local baker invented the Ruskin loaf and you've already seen the Ruskin honey. It was amazing how it gripped the imagination um, of local people. And my final story is about this historic house, its park and walled garden, a grade two listed building called Nearsbrook Hall, about two miles south of Sheffield city centre. And one of the extraordinary things is that the friends of Nearsbrook Hall rediscovered by reading the archive material that the hall had been the Ruskin Museum from 1890 to 1953, an astonishing example of how knowledge can be completely lost in just over half a century. And here is how the long gallery on the left and the sculpture gallery looked uh, in that time. So the first event was to throw open the hall's doors to the public with an event called Celebrating Nearsbrook Hall. Local artists displayed contemporary crafts, offered hands-on carving, as you see, and mosaic making, alongside guided tours to signal a new era of welcome, creativity and possibility for the hall. There has been, moreover, a gradual evolving collaboration with the Healy Trust which has been working for over 20 years to improve local spaces, secure key buildings and other local assets for the well-being of the people who live in Mearsbrook. And our collaboration is symbolised here by the image of Rian Thomas and Andy Jackson, who run the Healy Trust and our former master, Clive Wilner, poet and literary critic of a high order. And we now have our office, a guild office, uh, in Millersbrook Hall, which is a wonderful asset and a wonderful relationship. Finally, I am or have been devising a study tour or pilgrimage of Ruskin in Scotland to establish beyond all doubt uh, the Scottishness of Ruskin and his intellectual and family background. So I've devised this programme uh, and I've consulted with various colleagues and friends, including Jim Bates and Clive Wilmer, and um, embarking on detailed discussions with two fellow art workers, Guild brethren, deeply respected as effective cultural tour guides, Elaine Hirschel Ellis uh, and past master Peyton Skipwith. And where shall we go? Well, we should go to the border abbeys, to Rosslyn Chapel, of course, from Melrose, which you see on the left, it is but a hop, skip and a jump to Abbotsford House, Sir Walter Scott's own home, so we certainly go there. And also to the remoter places, including Brigger Turk, where, or near where, uh, John Everett Millet uh, painted the famous portrait of Ruskin standing on the rocks by a raging torrent. Wonderful, wonderful painting. How the, what the two of them must have been thinking, I don't know, because this was the time when um, uh, Mille famously fell in love with Ruskin's wife and much followed from that. In the storm cloud of the 19th century, Ruskin made us powerfully aware of the horrific dangers of pollution, whatever its source. Mentioning the dangers of pollution reminds me of the essay on traffic in The Crown of Wild Olive, and the following powerful utterance by Ruskin. Change must come. 
but it is ours to determine whether change of growth or change of death. Better or worse shall come, and it is for you to choose which. I often reflect that you can learn a good deal about great spirits like Ruskin from what their friends and contemporaries thought and felt about them at the time. I was recently at the Watts Gallery near Guildford in Surrey, established around 1900, to celebrate and display many of the paintings and sculptures of the great Victorian artist George Frederick Watts. There it is on the left, beautiful building, beautiful gallery, full of wonderful sculptures, sketches for sculptures and paintings. But the Watts Gallery also celebrates the life and work of his remarkable second wife, Mary Seaton Watts, who established a first-rate pottery there. Uh, she was the designer of the memorial chapel uh, in the cemetery, which is very close to the gallery, and which you see in the middle, with much gorgeous ornament, rich and meaningful in terracotta, and the amazing interior with its luscious colouring, which you see on the right. And incidentally, she called him Signor because of the strong influence which several years spent in Italy had had on his life and art. And you need to know that to enjoy this. Uh, no, one more slide to come. The whole place is a little bit like what I imagine Roycroft to be like, associated as it is with an artist's village and with the arts and crafts house called Limner's Lease which was their home. And on the left is the building, now the visitor center, but which was the pottery. The second image is of the, it's of the present pottery, a lovely building um, covered with shingles, uh, a common local material in Surrey. The poster for the great um, exhibition that's on at the moment with material lent from Yale and a lead door to remind me to say that one of the great building materials rediscovered through the arts and crafts movement was decorative lead work. And Letherby wrote a book on the subject published in 1897, which I again, again had, but this is such a lovely door. And they took particular trouble over rainwater goods. Now, George Frederick Watts and Mary Seaton Watts are very friendly with the ceramicist William de Morgan and his wife, Evelyn de Morgan, she, both writer and painter, all four regarded themselves as friends of Ruskin. And in fact, Ruskin was one of nine friends who clubbed together to buy Frederick and Mary Watts the Grand Piano, which is something I only discovered this week. They all four read Ruskin's work and they understood what he was getting at. They got it, as modern people say today. So beneath one of Evelyn de Morgan's paintings, I read the following extract from the diaries of Mary Seaton Watts, 20th of August, 1893. Mrs. De Morgan is here, our only visitor. Senior lay in the niche and talked of the chance that there would brought for mankind were he to realize that his present ideal is all for self, self-advancement, and chiefly by money getting for self, and instead was to fix eyes upon the grand universal idea of helping all to reach a happier and better state of things. A heaven might really dawn upon earth. And I've got something blocking the text on my screen, so I'm sorry I didn't get it quite right, but you can see at a glance and hear how deeply they had felt and understood Ruskin's central message. So my concluding point to you is this. We may all note that Ruskin says change must come, while George Frederick Watts says that change might come. Which is it to be in our generation and desperate time? Are we so very much opposed to a heaven upon earth 
that our actions will continue to be ineffective against the mighty battalions of selfish wealth and power. Surely, Ruskin calls us to action today. Thank you all so much for your patience. Thank you so Thank much, you. Peter. Uh, I think that was great how you incorporated everything from Ruskin to contemporary times back and forth, and, and it really was a special trip. Um, I was wondering if you could possibly uh, unshare your screen and we can get some people, see if there's any questions out there. Uh, there we are. Mm. And if anyone has any questions, you could either include it in the chat or um, if you, you can unmute yourselves as well. Uh, question for you, Peter. Is there evidence that Charles uh, McIntosh had the familiarity with Ruskin's writing thinking that Morris did? I'm not sure that there is actually. I, I have an a MSc student at the moment who actually works in the team at re of rebuilding the Glasgow School of Art and he's looked at the sources very thoroughly but I'll ask him the question and I certainly can't think of any anything myself. It's a very very good point. Alan can I make a comment? Sure. Okay so Jim Spates here. Um, Peter, that was marvelous. I mean, I learned so much. Um, I love the passionate presentation of these wonderful ideas as, um, as you're capable of expressing. It was, it was a real delight. I didn't really have much sense at all of Ruskin's influence on the arts and crafts in Scotland. Excellent, excellent. I wanted to make a comment um, about much of your talk reminded me of what I take to be a central argument of Ruskin's. Um, and I expressed it in one way in my talk last week, and I think you expressed it in yours, that Gothic is life. And life is Gothic. And it works best when every person is involved in expressing their own creative way of thinking, even though it may not be anything. Oh, Jim, you're freezing up. And I thought that was, sorry? Uh, I, I was very much taken by um, your image of, of, of the uh, uh, sculptor working on uh, St. John the Divine in, um, in the US, in New York City. I've been to St. John <laughs> the Divine many times and have looked at the new work and I didn't know it was his, but <clears throat> it, it, it's an example of, the, uh, of that life force working in public. I think that's very important to Ruskin always, that, that, that great art, and working on art should be a public experience, not a private one. A great painting shouldn't hide away in some very rich person's house to be never seen by anybody but that rich person, and even that on occasion. It should be available for everybody to see. He did that with his own artwork. He gave it to various universities and institutions. So I was taken by that, this notion of the arts and crafts as a living force in public space of everybody for everybody. That's a mm. comment more than a question. I like comments and I thought that was a brilliant one. Thank you very much indeed. And that's why these um, celebrating craft events are so important because not everybody has the opportunity to talk to craft people normally. And yet they're often very, very articulate, very, very special people and long to share what they do. And so, as you saw, I showed one or two images of that happening. Mm. Got a question, who was the artist for the very first slide that you had on? I noticed that question. question. And you know, uh, I'm having a middle-aged moment <laughs> at the moment, as we call it in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's so stupid that I can't remember. Um, and I, I can't easily access it at this second. Did anybody else remember what it was? <laughs> no. Oh, but you could find out. 
and send, yes. it, to, and send it to Alan and then he can forward yeah. it to the rest of us. I'd be delighted to do that. Of course, I shall know five minutes after we stop or two minutes from <laughs> <That's> the way <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Not even five. It'll be five seconds. As soon as you turn it off, it'll pop up. Yes. It's just popped up. Yeah. Um, let's see. Some more Hasn't questions. it just popped up at the bottom just of the screen? Popped up. Robert uh, Schultz? Uh, yes, Robert Weir Schultz. Oh, oh, of course, how silly of me. Um, yes, <laughs> the introductory image uh, of yeah. the wall painting. Yes, actually, it was for Robert Weir Schultz in his capacity as architect to the th third Marquess of Butte. But it was actually by somebody called Horatio Walter. Hmm? <laughs> I must confess I'm a bit tired having been talking for an hour and a half. Horatio Walter Lonsdale. And I'm so pleased you asked the question because he's one of those rather forgotten people. And yet in his day, he was absolutely brilliant. Uh, he was of that generation born in the 1850s, so lived well into the 20th century, something like 1929, I think he died. And he found the ideal client in the third Marquess of Butte. Um, and if, if you ever go to uh, Mount Stuart on the Isle of Butte, nearly everything in the house, except the furniture, which was designed by Robert Weir Schultz, is designed by this man, uh, Horatio Walter Lonsdale. And he trained as an architect. And um, I'm sure you've all heard of the architect called William Burgess, spelled B-U-R-G-E-S, one S. And he um, carried out heroic work for the third Marquis at um, Cardiff Castle and at another castle uh, called Casteth Goch. And again, Lonsdale did a lot of the designing. And uh, when I've, one, on one of the occasions when I was working in the archives at Mount Stuart, I, I was shown the most exquisite drawing by him of a little casket which was made of silver. And when the Marquis died in 1900, it turned out that he'd, in his will, he'd asked that his widow should take his heart to Jerusalem and bury it in the Mount of Olives. And uh, anyway, she did. Um, how heartbreaking that must have been. She was a very lovely person too. And, but she brought it back because it was part of the patrimony, I suppose. And they gave me some images of it, which um, on another occasion uh, I will use. But such a heartbreaking thing. And he also even designed a wedding cake for their eldest child, who was called Lady Margaret Crichton Stewart. Uh, she was the first woman ever in the world to become a, a master mariner, a certificated um, master mariner. So I, I, I love that thought too. She wasn't just content with being a ladyship and having rich parents. She developed a passion and a skill of her own. Um, and in her sitting room at the House of Falkland, the wall is covered with finely molded, modelled seagulls by George Washington Jack, who was Philip Webb's last assistant, but, but was a sculptor. Uh, and furniture designer, as well as an architect. The arts and crafts world is a fascinating one. And in Britain, they all interconnect, but the Scottish ones are not as well known as those who worked in or near London, uh, as is still the case today. So I feel a special need to stick up for the Scottish ones. And it's a splendid thing about the third Marquis, who was possibly the richest person in Britain at the time, but was scholarly, uh, spiritual. He was a convert to Roman Catholicism uh, and he walked everywhere in London. Uh, he was a really interesting man, um, but his passion was art and architecture at what is from our point of view exactly at the right moment. And by the way, he was another one who read his Stones of Venice uh, and his Seven Lamps. I don't know where, what else he read and he also uh, loved to read uh, Scott, Sir Walter Scott's novels. He was such a sympathetic patron. 
We have another question from uh, William Galloway uh, regarding a passage from the Stone of Venice, uh, which I guess is prior to the passage that you quoted at the beginning. Um, he says, I find it difficult to explain to students, particularly students of architecture, on this passage on a large scale and in works determinable by line and rule, it is indeed both possible and necessary that the thoughts of one man should be carried out by the labor of others. In this sense, I have already defined the best architecture to be the expression of the mind of manhood by the hands of childhood. It says, my feeble attempts to answer tend to revolve around the impracticality of an entire building being built by a single pair of hands. Do you perhaps have a more satisfactory answer than I will be able to muster? I don't think I do. I don't think it's one of Ruskin's greatest insights, personally. And uh, because I, I've been, in, in my first role, I was uh, working with cathedrals, the whole cathedrals and churches for 22 years. And I could see and feel and see it from the archives too, how there's always been collaboration and co-working uh, to achieve architecture. And a, a lovely modern example of it, which I don't know whether this might be helpful, but um, I, I nearly included this story. A friend of mine called Rory Young, who is a really distinguished sculptor, lives in Sirencester. He was commissioned to design um, a new west doorway for York Minster because bits of the old one were falling on people's heads and you can't have that happening in a place open to the public or used for processions on Sundays and so on and uh, we spent 10 years I was in York at the time we spent 10 years studying the problems and uh, every kind of treatment was tried but failed uh, the reasons we thought were connected with a chemical cleaning um, many years before. Chemicals should be avoided on stone buildings and there's now very strong legislation about that but half a century ago there wasn't. Anyway it was decided to have a new portal surrounding the actual doors and Rory and the canon theologian of the cathedral spent many hours, probably many days, discussing its theology, discussing its meaning, and gradually elaborating the ideas together. And I used to think to myself, I bet that's what happened in the Middle Ages. Um, the sculptor wouldn't have gone forth and just thought, oh, I think I might do a Moses and Aaron today, or I fancy doing a virgin and child. You know, it just didn't happen like that. There had to be organization. And if you look at the west fronts of cathedrals, as I did with you a little bit this evening, or if you look at the capitals on the columns in a great Gothic building anywhere in Europe, you will see that there is a program, a story that's being told. Of course, you, we see it very strongly on the Doge's Palace in Venice, don't we, which is the building, as Jim reminded us the other day, that Ruskin said was uh, for him the center of the world, a very odd remark in a way, <laughs> uh, but it is of course a very, very wonderful building, including and especially the carving, but it means something. And that meaning came out of deep debate, I think. Uh, and, and sometimes the patron, uh, whoever was paying for it would have very strong views and sometimes might effectively consult with people who knew better than he did or her, she did her, themselves. And another rather wonderful story I can tell you because I happen to have been very recently both to Salisbury Cathedral and to Wells Cathedral, uh, both of which I was involved with um, in earlier years. And at Wells they had a very very precious uh, manuscript book which was the writings of an obscure saint called St. Hugh of St. Victor. And from that book the priests of the early 13th century worked out the iconography of the West Front. Uh, and later, about 30 years later, the behindhand in doing their West Front wrote to the Dean Wells and said, hey, could we borrow your copy of St. Hugh of St. Victor, please? We want to do our West Front now. 
And it happened. I imagine somebody took it on horseback from Wells to Salisbury. And 20 more years went by and the, the librarian noticed it was missing. So a letter went from Salisbury, uh, from Wells to Salisbury saying, Oi, can we have our copy of St. Hugh and St. Victor back, please? And um, no, no one had realized this until the dean, who was dean at the time of the restoration, Patrick Mitchell, a very great and dear man and a dear friend, uh, who sadly died about uh, just over 18 months ago. And he had a term off and went to his college in Oxford, Merton, and he studied the theology of the West Front really deeply. And he figured out just exactly how they got it. There must be stories like that between every bit of medieval iconography, I guess. Just a, anyway, I'll go on thinking about that passage. Thank you very much. Just a couple quick questions. Uh, how do we find out about a, your pending Ruskin tour? Oh, Ruskin tour, it's got there. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, you can tell I'm getting tired. Uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yes, how do we find out? Well, at the moment, uh, the best way would be to write to me. I don't mind your giving people my email at all. Uh, it's my own email, my very own, and I would send the draft because I'd love to have comment on it. Uh, I, I regard it as something in the making at the moment. And, and then... And also we have to be able to come over there. So you, I know, I know. Mr. Johnson about that. Yes. Well, I want to come over to you as well. <laughs> I, I long to see Roycroft. I've read Alan's wonderful account of it, 50 pages of pure pleasure. Thank you. Alan, very much for that. Mm. Alan and, and Peter, mm. I want to mention one thing before we sign off for the day, that the issue that came up to me repeatedly in Peter's talk was the relationship between artisans doing things in the arts and crafts and the very wealthy. I mean, the, the point is, is that almost always in the history of art, it's just not arts and crafts people, but fine arts, that fine artists and arts and crafts people can't survive unless they make their things for people who are extremely rich, who will then not use a, put those things in the public space so that people can enjoy them as, as Ruskin always argued. It's a, it's a conundrum, it's something we always have to think through, but I, would, I think it would be a very interesting chat for us to have as the conference goes on. What, what, mm -hmm. How should we treat this issue of getting our living from people, some of whom Rev. Ruskin always said to his father, the people you've had at your, at your uh, dining room table are scoundrels. Mm -hmm. I mean, they exploit their workers, but they're the ones that bought the sherry and allowed Ruskin to travel to the Alps. So it's a very interesting question. Mm. Yes, and <clears throat> there's a Morris story in um, uh, the biography of Philip Webb by Lester B. Uh, he was, Morris, Morris was painting the dining room ceiling at a Philip Webb house called Roundton Grange, which alas was demolished in the 1960s. Can you imagine a house with ceilings painted by William Morris with his own hands? And the owner who was called um, uh, Sir Lothian Bell heard Morris shouting and screaming. And so he rushed along to the dining room to see what was going on. And Morris was walking up and down, as we know he did, sort of arguing with himself. And he said, um, I just can't get this straight. All my ideals, all that I want to do, and yet I have to spend my time ministering to the needs of the swinish rich. <laughs> and at that point, presumably, his host came through the door <laughs> and said, well, it's time for lunch, old chap. <laughs> but it was a dilemma. It is a dilemma for us today. But what I think the world needs is more modesty. Why should there be 1% of a population owning most of the wealth? It's just obscene. Ruskin recognized that it was obscene and he wrote about it. Morris recognized that it was obscene and he wrote about it. And we haven't moved on today. If anything, we've, it's got worse. So we need people like all of us, you know, to try to be the leaven in the lump at least. And, to be content with modest rewards and modest achievements. 
and that quotation I gave you from Evelyn de Morgan, I thought it was so interesting that she and the Wattsies had figured it out, either through reading and pondering Ruskin or because they'd had exactly the same thoughts themselves. Anyway, it's been lovely talking to you all. I'm sorry I went on so long. I, I really apologise for that. But um, anyway, it was real, really a privilege to take part. And I hope I'll see you next Saturday. Thank you again, Peter. Pleasure. And, and for Bye. those who are still on, just a, a quick... Uh, preview of next week. So next week we will actually have two speakers on. Um, we have uh, two contemporary artists talking about, uh, one of them is a watercolorist and how she found much of her inspiration in some of Ruskin's work. And the second is actually a photographer and how you, you, many times you don't think of photography as being a part of the arts and crafts movement. Uh, but Peter Potter will be talking about um, about the, the history of photography at Roycroft as well as his current work. Um, and I'll pass along some more information about that on, on, on our week uh, update for you. And uh, I, we did have somebody on the, on the, the talk today, uh, anybody who is in the Western New York area, um, she just wanted to say that there's an op the opening of the Buffalo Canal Long Shed project is next weekend. Uh, it's a public craft project, which looks very, very interesting and exciting. Um, if anybody in the area is interested in that, um, that is happening next weekend. And I think that's it for the day. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed. Peter, thank you again. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, and we will hopefully see you all next week uh, here once again. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.